Let's talk design, his designer for the birth of a nation and intolerance. Huck. Work. Huck didn't design it. Huck built the set. Remarkable. He's, he said, okay, I want, yeah, well, well he was a, a stage carpenter. Oh, one second, sorry. Okay, let's talk about it. How did he find him? I have no idea. But he did I don't know. I, I have no idea when he started with him, and I have no idea exactly when he left him or why. He was there from about birth on. I don't, maybe he was even earlier uh, with Avenging Conscience. I don't know. Maybe he came with the studio out in California. I have no idea. But by having a, the theatrical background, using theatrical carpenters, he learned how to make foldable sets, uh, do, uh, designing in, was it false perspective? I love his designs. I mean, well, I don't know whether you can say that's his designs. I think Griffin said, "I want a wall," and maybe he sketched out what a wall looked like, and then the guy built the wall, and then faced it. And I don't think that's really design in that sense. I think he was a just knew how to build a set that wouldn't fall down. So, who are the guys he found that was the World's Fair? He was there. San Francisco. The San Francisco Exposition. Yeah, well, according to what Henneberry told me, uh, he found two, uh, one, one guy who was good at sculpting and the other one who was good at decoration. And he brought those two fellows down from San Francisco and he taught the other workmen how to do the detailing. And, uh, and I guess they just set up, the set design consisted of having bits to look through the camera and f find out where the set ought to go or where the wall would go and you hammer a wooden stake in and then you hammer one here and you run that line and you run that line. And then I guess the sets grew. The first two were going to be like 40 feet, 50 feet. Then they became 90 feet. And then in the film, it says that the, the walls, for example, were 300 feet. That's, of course, complete nonsense, maybe 90 feet. 300-foot wall would, would fall down. With got terrible winds out there, you know. I, I, I went, went through one of those Santa Ana winds. I mean, it's almost a cyclone. We're talking about 50, 60 miles an hour wind. Realize the air pressure on a 300-foot wall? Are you kidding? He did some remarkable stuff. What made in uh, Hearts of the World? What makes that film so special? Hearts of the World. Mm -hmm. I know. I think the opening of it is extremely gentle. I think that uh, uh, Griffith sees the tragedy of what war does. It's not an all gung ho. Uh, thing. Isn't it great? We're all going to go die for our country at all. I think he realizes that war is is tragic, is painful, uh, affects a lot of people. Uh, I think there's some lovely scenes between Lily and, and Bobby Harron that are as delicate as anything. I don't think uh, Lily and Gish ever looked better than in that film. And uh, if there was ever a love affair between the two, ever, that would be the that would be the period in, in 1917. Twitter, you know each other so well, you don't even care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and I, I, he sees her, he shows her here as a sex object to some extent. The camera pans down her body to her legs, and we never see Lillian as a desirable woman any other place in the movies, as I can recall. But here she is, I mean, Bobby is looking at her, that is, Griffiths is looking at her as, hey, this is a delightful little item here. Was uh, the film successful? Yeah, very successful. Didn't help that we had the influenza epidemic towards the few months into it, and then the end of the war didn't help it any either. But the the, um, the the audience reaction was absolutely fabulous. I don't think he ever had a better reaction than that one, ever. Who's this competition of other directors coming in, other films? The industry is changing now, and he's trying to make... Well, 
But you got C.B. DeMille uh, doing things. C.B. DeMille also wanted to make a big historical feature, and he did that Joan of Arc thing, which didn't do very well either. Uh, and you have ints with civilization, by no means as good as, as intolerance. But nobody yeah. remembers any films, but they do remember... The Heart of Humanity, uh, Alan Holbar with the... Holbar, whatever it is, and he made... Uh, and Von Stroheim was in that, and I think that's well done, particularly because of Von Stroheim, who well, I think gave ideas to this fellow. Where does other great films of Griffith that stand out, what made Orphans of the Storm different than other films? What was so good about that film? I think it's a good epic film. Uh, at least it doesn't have uh, the racial thing to bother it, uh, and it's it's not a bad story. He, he took that old play of the two orphans, and he integrated it with um, the uh, French Revolution. It's not in the original play, but Griffith blended the two, same way he blended the Civil War and the Birth of a Nation, uh, of the, the Klansman story. Uh, and, and he did a nice job, actually, in, uh, in Birth of a Nation, too. Uh, really, uh, Dixon's book only, re only begins, really, in the second half. Uh, and he did the same thing with Way Down East. Way, the Way Down East play uh, is about, begins halfway through Way Down East. The whole f first half of Way Down East is pre-play material. People don't always know that. He made a mistake by in the studio, didn't he? Terrible. Terrible mistake. Uh, for odd reasons. And the more I think about it, uh, he bought one of the most expensive residential properties in which he couldn't even run electric cable because nobody wanted it. And all the people who lived nearby didn't want uh, trucks and, and uh, lumber and and uh, uh, thousands of extras running in and out of uh, past their property. Uh, and he paid uh, about $400,000 for this. He could have bought an equal amount of property, probably with a building on it, in New Jersey or some other part, uh, for, for 30000 So he spent an additional 400000 for prime property. Uh, this is like buying a couple of hundred feet of uh, property on Park Avenue and pushing it down to make a garage. <laughs> you don't do this. It's stupid. And uh, so he bought a, the, a millionaire's mansion, which was a white elephant. Nobody wanted it. Griffith bought it. And then he spelled, spent all his money buying the property and spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to build up studios, buildings all over the place. And then when he sold it three or four years later, he had to pay to take all the buildings down. So he didn't, and by doing that, he used up all his capital. So he had to borrow money to make films. And if you know anything about the, the mechanics, financial mechanics of a film, you make the film, you've, you've got a big obligation once your film is shot. Then you've got to pay for the prints. Then you've got to pay for the publicity. And then you put it in the theater. And then you have to wait until the money comes back from the theaters. That takes two years often, or at least a year, year and a half. Which means you have no money coming in for a year and a half. So if you want to make your next film, you've got to borrow the money to make the next film. And then you've got to wait a year and a half for that. Meantime, you're making two films a year. So you get behind very quickly with interest payments. And each time you go, f so each time you make the film and the film then plays, uh, the first money going from the film is paying back the mortgage that you've made on the film. And so you never get money into your pocket. So and he really he, needed those re-releases of The Birth that happened in 20 Yeah, but he wasn't making that much from The Birth. I mean, he had a percentage of it. Uh, Dixon had 25%. The Aitken brothers had over 50%. And Griffith had portioned his out in various ways. So he wasn't making a great deal on it. 